presentation of anti-Semitism, white nationalism today. That's a lot of things. Um, this specifically, this training is not a checklist of what is and is not anti-Semitism. Uh, this isn't a, uh, you know, here, here's a checklist for how to put a flag on the play. This is uh, meant to give us a bigger picture of where these things come from, because ultimately any form of oppression, any form of marginalization or belittling of people, racism, homophobia, they all come from bigger things, bigger cultural things. We pick them up along the way um, because inherently we have to get ideas from somewhere. The ideas are from elsewhere. They don't just originate in us magically by themselves. So that is why we're going to be talking much more about these big picture things rather than, oh, if somebody says this, followed by this, that counts as an anti science So just, just want to make sure that no, uh, that folks know what we're getting into. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to give us a quick little case study, a little example of um, the, the types of stuff we can see today. Uh, this is pretty much the only one of these examples we will see. The rest of this will be giving us the tools to be thinking about next time we see something a little off, how to pull it apart. So right here, uh, this is a televised advertisement from right here in Minnesota in 2018. This ran in the first congressional district, Southern Minnesota, um, in uh, that uh, House race uh, in 2018. Um, and here we see George Soros. Um, he's used a lot in a lot of uh, politicized things today. Um, and he's Jewish. And he is actually a very wealthy person. I'm not going to be here defending billionaires. That's not my thing. I don't particularly like billionaires of any sort. Um, <laughs> But George Soros is kind of used as a fill-in for a uh, much older trope of the Rothschilds, which were kind of the original wealthy example of, of, of Jews who were kind of used as a fill-in for, if there's one wealthy Jew, then they all must be wealthy, secretly high uh, That goes back to the 1800s. But here we see George Soros, you know, he's got kind of a sinister little fly hands thing going that you see lots of movie villains do. Piles of cash, that shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, that's a pretty common one with anti-Semitism. Um, in the back, there's kind of a grainy black and white photo that we can see just hints of and uh, doing some sleuthing with some of uh, my other colleagues. We found that that's actually an image from the 1965 Watts riots in LA. Um, so, that is where Colin Kaepernick and these fellows come into the picture. Because here we've got Connoisseur of Chaos. He's the funder of the left. And uh, there's hearkening back to the chaos of the 1960s, and specifically this chaos that's associated with Black communities rising up against their oppression. And um, here we see Colin Kaepernick taking a knee and looking towards George Soros. That's an intentional thing. When you're, when you're doing Photoshop like this, I will tell you, it takes a long time to cut people out and paste them into stuff. I like doing it for fun sometimes, and I grew up with this technology, and it still takes me like an hour to do this. So that's an intentional choice. Um, and having Kaepernick look towards Soros is meant to go and evoke that he is looking to him for orders. And that's also another very common thing when we see the way that anti-Semitism and anti-Blackness usually show up in US political discourse, um, which we'll get into later. But here it's to imply that Colin Kaepernick couldn't possibly have made this decision on his own. He must be taking orders from someone else. Um, and uh, that someone else would be this connoisseur of chaos. Lastly, we see these fellows in the corner. Uh, they're dressed in all black. Uh, you know, they've got their, their masks on. This is 2018. Remember, wearing masks in public was not a thing yet. Um, so that was assumed to be nefarious if you wore a mask at protest, um, even if you were going to get tear gassed. But here it's supposed to imply that these are these vast antiquos, these roaming anarchists. And I can tell you, somebody who has a lot of anarchists in my life who I love very dearly, you could never go and get 12 of them to coordinate their outfits. <laughs> thing to do. And that's why it is really just meant to be a scary image um, more than anything else. Um, so a little bit of historical background. Uh, so how did we get here? And this is where it's going to seem like a little out of here for just a moment, but trust me, it ties together. Um, I want us to be thinking about huge, massive social changes that went into uh, the last several centuries. And I'm going to zip through these in the interest of time, but a lot of times we never even hear about these. Sometimes we hear about colonization. Um, maybe we hear about colonization of Africa or the Americas being colonies and gaining their independence. Sometimes we hear about imperialism. It's used weirdly a lot of times, but we rarely hear about the enclosures. And that's what came first. In fact, every white American probably got here due to the enclosures. 
The enclosures was the mass removal of people from their common lands. In Europe, all across the place, yes, during that era of feudalism, the princes would come and collect the taxes and everything, but people, communities, owned those lands in common. They farmed those lands in common. And they did that for well over about a thousand years after the fall of the Roman Empire. And slowly but surely, their lands were taken by the princes. People were pushed off of their lands. They were pushed into early cities or many factories. And that's where we start seeing the budding parts of the Industrial Revolution. I know part of half of my family came from Norway, and they were peasants in the early 1800s. And they left because the local princes bought up their land and forced them off. That's the story that went on all across Europe for several centuries. It was a tighter and tighter squeeze. It's kind of like how today people are losing their homes to huge um, private equity firms. You know, people have their mortgages go into uh, default, and then these huge corporations come in and gobble them up. It's a similar, not exactly the same situation, uh, several hundred years ago. And it took a long time. And enclosures still happen today. There are many communities in Africa and South America that still have commonly held lands that are being gobbled up by corporations and things like that. So the enclosures aren't a fixed period of time. And neither is colonization. Colonization could have never happened without those enclosures, without people being forced off of their lands and those princes and wealthy aristocrats starting to get more money than they knew what to do with. They started to develop the first forms of joint stock venture companies. That's where we got the East India Company and all these other places that kind of were the push for colonization, that looking for spices, that looking for gold. We well, had to get the money from somewhere, and it was a lot of kind of bored aristocrats wanting to see their money turn into more money. But we didn't have fractional reserve lending and things like that back then. So instead, it was let's go and take stuff from other places. And that's how colonization worked. It was this replacement and displacement of indigenous communities with populations from those home countries, Europe. And those people forced off of their lands during the enclosures were the perfect shock troops to just flood into places because not everybody wanted to move to the Americas. That's a hard life. You have to build new things. Not everybody wanted to necessarily do that. A lot of people came to as indentured servants because they were horribly in debt. Um, colonization is that process, and it's marked by genocides of local populations as well as enslavement because a lot of times colonization needed to go and start making more money than it could based off of the natural growth of people just moving from Europe. That's why we saw the explosion of uh, human chattel slavery in um, all across the Americas in the uh, 16 and 17 and, eight, and it dies in the 1800s. And then we've got imperialism. Imperialism is something that a lot of people end up getting confused about. A lot of times we think colonization and imperialism just means a country owning a place on a map. You know, we look at the maps of Britain from the 1950s. Well, they own half of Africa on the map. That's imperialism. That is. But it's a little bit more than that. And it's important for us to think about that because imperialism is colonization perfected. Imperialism is the mass extraction of resources from those columns. No longer do we need to go and send a whole bunch of farmers to go and create this yeoman civilization of farmers. Instead, we can just build a bunch of trains to go into the interior of the country and take all the cobalt out and keep moving. That's a process that still is happening. And it's important to think about because it does affect the way in which we think about anti-Semitism today. Because imperialism helps describe some of these really big things that we see in motion today, like the cobalt mining in Africa that happens with literal child slaves, or cocoa for our chocolate. Same thing. That's been going on for a very long time. But most of those companies are owned by companies in France. They are owned by companies in Britain or the United States. And it's been that way since those places were held on that map. The companies are still the same companies, just because the place is independent on a map doesn't mean it has real independence. In uh, most of West Africa today, um, those countries that gained their independence in the 50s and 60s, their entire GDP, everything that they bring in in taxes, has to be held in a fictionalized currency called the colonial French franc, which is held only in French banks. They don't actually have financial control over their own independence. That is what imperialism can look like. So there's, imperialism is complex, and I just want to stress that it is more than simply owning places on a map. So it's important to think about how all of these big changes, these mass removals of people from their lands, how that affects people emotionally, how that affects people interpersonally, because even though we didn't have control over that as individuals, it certainly did impact the ways in which our ancestors were moving through the world. It impacted the ways in which our ancestors came to the United States. It impacted the ways in which other people's uh, uh, ancestors 
uh, were impacted if they weren't in the United States. Colonialism and imperialism impacted people's lives everywhere, not just in the form of the products we can get instantaneously, but also in the ways that we interact with each other. So history is more than just dates and old dead dudes. Bill and Ted learned it over 30 years ago on their excellent adventure. And it's important for us to think about that. History is more than just dates and people and uh, the occasional proclamations. Um, so what this whole period that I just described, that zipping through uh, several hundred years worth of uh, socio-political and economic changes is that we end up seeing here in the United States and much of uh, what we know as the West, so Europe, Australia, all that kind of NATO power type of thing, um, is um, when, we, when we see this, we see European impression of indigenous peoples in the Americas uh, looks like erasure, genocide, or if not complete genocide, the kind of idea that, well, there's nobody left anymore anyways, erasure. Um, Oppression of Africans looks like exploitation. It looks like enslavement or just continued exploitation through, as we saw with segregation in the South, where there is a second set of laws. Not everything gets corrected instantaneously in the 1960s. Laws aren't a magic wand that we wave that makes everything hit the edit undo button like a computer. Um, we can do our best. It makes good changes, but it doesn't do everything all at once. Um, and the oppression of Jews looks like scapegoating. That's a story that's built over time, a very long period of time. And that's what this presentation is going to be showing us. So a big part of what all of these uh, big uh, objects in motion did is kind of give a, uh, a universal language of Christian hegemony across much of uh, the European and uh, you know, American world. And that's the preponderance of Christian values, belief systems, cultural norms throughout all aspects of society. That does not mean that people are going out and saying, I am Christian, you have to listen to me. Uh, but it does mean when you have, let's say, a room of people in a school board, right? And let's say everybody on the school board happens to be Christian. Maybe they're the denominations, that's okay. But sometimes we see our school boards don't necessarily favor, like, have days off on their calendars for non-Christian holidays. That's an example of how Christian hegemony can look like when it's it's not intentional. People aren't looking to harm people. It's just the you have too many people in the room who have the same worldview, you kind of end up losing out on what some other people might be experiencing or needing. It does not need to be nefarious. I really want to stress that. Um, a lot of times when we see things like this and it's talking about our uh, our communities or could be uh, perceived as talking about our communities, it can feel like a personal attack. This is to describe this kind of like preponderance of things that happens. It just It's the slip ups that happen. But all of these things have been built over time. A lot of assumptions were built into our legal systems, basing them off of old, uh, like old church law, uh, be it from Northern Europe or Southern Europe, uh, so be it from the Catholic Church or the many uh, denominations that break off during the Protestant Reformation. There's many aspects of our civil legal system that are based off of Christian notions. Um, and that's just what Christian hegemony describes. It just describes kind of the ways in which that flavor is kind of baked into our culture. Um, so I know there's a lot before we get to anti-Semitism, but I want to establish a lot of a lot of words because a lot of times we hear words get used in TV and media. They don't really describe them often. And then we kind of shout at each other, especially if we get into political debates with each other. And we kind of are all using different definitions. So I like to define what I'm talking about. Uh, so that way we know what I'm talking about in my presentation cohesively. It might not be the same definition as everybody, but I use the same definitions throughout my own presentations. And that, that's my courtesy to folks, that I want to, to be clear about what I mean. Um, so what is whiteness? I want us to be thinking for the purposes of this presentation, whiteness, it's a social designation. It starts in the colonial Americas, largely as a social designation in early law in order to go and separate out those European indentured servants from indentured servants who were brought from Africa. And then over a couple of decades, it quickly accelerates into uh, law. And it also begins to be adopted across the European sphere. It's not just in the Americas. In fact, it actually, uh, it doesn't start with the British, it actually starts with the Spaniards. Um, but it becomes a useful shorthand for governance within what we now know as the New World, uh, where there is a large amount of people starting to be brought over as enslaved persons from Africa. There's also a large amount of people who are kind of enslaved being brought over to Europe in the form of indentured servitude. And in order to go and create this difference of, well, you're a better off, still a slave than these folks, 
whiteness begins to develop over time. Um, it doesn't instantaneously become what we know it today. It takes a very long time to develop. But as the 18th and 19th centuries come along to the 17th, 1800s, there's a like booms in science. We've got the Enlightenment, all of this stuff coming around. And whiteness begins to go and have scientific applications. So if you are a fan of uh, science and uh, uh, animals, uh, Carl Linnaeus uh, creates his uh, chart of here's how all these animals are related. He gives the Latin names, all that stuff. Uh, really cool stuff. I love that. Uh, but at the same time, race starts getting put in there. People are put in that category as well. So as Carl Linnaeus is mapping out, here's how all these different types of bears are kind of related. Um, people are doing the same thing with here is how people from different parts of the world are actually different species. That's how we start seeing scientific racism develop. And it continues to develop over the 1800s as science becomes bigger and bigger. We start getting phrenology, the measurement of skull sizes. You get Charles Darwin coming along with the origin of the species. And while not everybody really likes the, uh, the whole uh, concept of Darwinism when it applies to evolution of all species, quite a few people in that time period who don't like that part adopt the basic concept of Darwinism and then turn it into social Darwinism. This idea that there are competing races of people and they apply those logics of Darwinism that, that survival of the fittest but instead to people, be it by class, that poor people are inherently going to have to compete a little bit more uh, because they're not biologically suited, that's why they're poor, or for, for entire ethnicities of people. This is why they're like that. Basically, science is kind of used to go and justify the way that the world is set up in the 1800s. They look back and they say, oh, well, the reason why Europe is dominating everyone else is because we're just biologically better. That's what race science becomes in the 1800s. It sticks with us throughout the 1900s. Um, but it's become a cultural identity at this point. It's not just a racial identity because that's not as popular in law anymore. It's not as popular in science anymore. Race as a scientific concept is less popular, but the cultural identity that we have the shared um, uh, history of being white is becoming a more and more popular conceptualization, which I'll get into later about why that's dangerous. Uh, nationalism is another one that people hear a lot. Uh, nationalism is not the same as patriotism. I just, that's the quickest way to say this. Patriotism uh, is, is being uh, proud of your country. You know, it, it is being able to also criticize it, you know, like that, that type of patriotic, I'm living under the values of my country when my country does wrong. Nationalism is a blind devotion to whatever concept of country it is. And nationalism can also apply to countries that don't exist yet, right? There's tons of nationalists, many different backgrounds. Nationalism inherently doesn't have to be bad, but it can very quickly be warped into something that can encourage people to do harm to others. So when we hear nationalist rhetoric, it is something to, to, to pause and, and, and dig in a little bit. I personally, when I hear people getting really, really gung-ho nationalistic, um, I, I don't call them out. I, I ask them why you feel that way. Um, I think that's important. Uh, but nationalism is something that developed over the 1800s as well. It plays a very big role in the way that anti-Semitism, of course, white nationalism, since it has it in there, uh, work today. Oh, um, so how is all of this relevant to today's presentation? The forms of oppression that we see today are culturally ingrained. They've been formed and reinforced by all these changing social, political, economic relationships over the past few hundred years. Basically, we're all taking in these messages in a bottle coming down the river of time. We're slowly picking up all of this, uh, all of this stuff, and we don't necessarily know where it comes from. Um, that doesn't mean that any of us are bad for the times that we repeat it. It just means that we live in a complicated world, and time affects us. Um, Anti-Semitism and racialization, both of these things, in their modern incarnations, are direct results of these economic shifts, and we'll be seeing that in a moment. In the 21st century, we're interconnected as a global society. Way faster communication than ever before. In the blink of an eye, we're now able to talk to people on the other side of the globe across not just territory, but languages. You can hit a button and you can now talk to somebody who speaks a completely different language than you and things will automatically translate. That's incredible. The world is huge, but at the same time, it feels smaller. The world has shrunk in a way. And because of that, it can feel like things are uh, even more out of control. So we need to understand these large cultural notions like racialization. We can't view them in isolation in time and space. If we do that, then we miss out on the fact that people are communicating and thinking and collaborating on things very quickly. Concepts develop much faster than they used to. Um, and these huge changes in human society 
um, at least for the purposes of this presentation, I want us to be thinking about this semi-universal feeling of detachment called social malaise. This is a concept I got from a 1947 study on um, American uh, fascist rhetoric that was it was commissioned by the American Jewish Committee, and they looked at the ways in which um, uh, Nazi collaborate, like Nazi fans, we'll call them here in the United States, were actually quite successful in organizing in the 1930s. They wanted to know why. And this is the concept that is a good shorthand for thinking about. I think it's no surprise that things aren't necessarily the best right now. And a lot of people can feel that. And we all feel it in different ways. And that's what social malaise is describing, that feeling that things aren't quite right. Some people are going to feel it a little more than others. But the thing is, is that social malaise can be utilized by people to go and agitate people into other things. There's other ways to address social malaise. We do it uh, with mutual aid. We do it with our churches, with, with going and, and bringing food to communities, right? That's how you can address social malaise. That's how you can address uh, making sure that people don't feel alone and sad. But some view that feeling of detachment as an opportunity in order to go and incite uh, violence. So I kind of already described it. So what is it? It's this constant, uh, at least for our purposes today, of these compounded emotional and social effects that uh, people have dealt with. It's not just the feelings of I was promised that maybe uh, I'd be able to buy a house at age 30 and that wasn't meant, those types of social promises, but also the fact that human beings, we might not realize this, but did you know we don't actually normally sleep at eight hour intervals? That's a product of the Industrial Revolution. Prior to that, it's why babies wake up every couple hours in the middle of the night. Human beings woke slept in roughly about four to six hour cycles and wake up in the middle of the night. It was actually a normal part of human biology. It's something that has changed in order to go and fit the economic demands of the last couple hundred years. Um, those are examples. That feeling of tiredness can also contribute to social malaise. So we're not just talking about those cultural promises that people have. We're also talking about those kind of biological changes that come from these big changes in society. All of those can deal with that feeling, can contribute to that feeling that things aren't quite right. Um, and fascists, and we're gonna define who that, what that actually means. I'm not talking about political parties right now. I'm not talking about you voted this person, you voted that person. That's not what I'm talking about. There are violent groups that recognize and agitate that common feeling in order to encourage people towards violence. Um, so here it is, as promised, the anti-Semitism. I know, we've all been waiting for it. And it's more than, if you haven't picked up on this by now, it's going to be a lot more than just personal slurs or personal hatred. Um, it's much bigger. So, oh, was there another one in the tool notes? Uh, it's this one, and then it goes right to, oh, you're right, 11 is missing. Oh, it might be on skip mode. Um, That's okay. Okay. I'll describe that I know what the slide is. Okay. It's what is anti-Semitism. So what is anti-Semitism? It is. Oh, do you almost have it? I'm going to see if I can find it. <laughs> there it is. There we go. All right. So anti-Semitism is one specific form of anti-Jewish pressure. It's not all, all of, uh, like we, all forms of anti-Jewish pressure are not anti-Semitism. I know that sounds a little confusing uh, and we'll get into why. But anti-Semitism is describing the system of ideas uh, that are based on that Christian hegemony that I talked about and related to white supremacy because anti-Semitism has grown at the same time as these concepts of scientific racism has developed. And it's been passed down through society's institutions, enabling the scapegoating of Jews, the ideological or physical targeting of Jews that will result from that. Boom. So how does this end up working? Um, so anti-Semitism, that's a long way of saying that anti-Semitism is a set of stories and myths. It's basically folklore, right? Folklore is built up by people talking to each other, sharing stories over time. And that's what anti-Semitism is. But the difference with anti-Semitism versus everyday folklore is that most of our anti-Semitic stories and concepts came from people in power, passing them down to people without power, saying, these are people you should be afraid of. And then over time, everyday people just continue those stories. But when we follow them to their origin point, it is overwhelmingly either prominent people within various incarnations of the church, uh, pre-schism, post-schism, you name it, many, many periods, um, and also princes, nobles, 
newspaper magnets, you name it. So it's a set of stories that ends up coming from people in power at first and then being introduced to everyday people. And it's meant to go and protect those people in power by shifting blame of society's problems to Jews, especially during uh, moments of uh, change or social unrest. All throughout medieval Europe, there's tons and tons of pogroms against Jews as various nobles uh, are dealing with social unrest. Maybe there's grain shortages. Well, it's not my fault that there's a grain shortage. It's not my fault that we shipped off all of the grain to my cousin in, in Saxony. Um, it is the Jews' fault because they were the ones going and uh, you know tabulating how many uh, uh, things of grain um, there were. So it must mean it was their fault. Those are the types of stories we're talking about. We're talking about the compounded interest of tons and tons of these little stories popping up over time. Um, so next slide. Don't worry, this will be in an email afterwards, um, but uh, this is a chart of how these stories have changed over time. So if we go back to the, to the Roman Empire, right, um, when Christianity first is splitting away from Judaism, as they're each turning into their modern religions. Judaism after the destruction of the Second Temple looks different than it did before, and Christianity looks different in the Roman Empire than it does today. Um, we start seeing the first little bits of what modern anti-Semitism eventually becomes. So in the late Roman Empire, um, we see the concept of supersessionism be the main form of uh, ostracization of Jews. And supersessionism is, in short, the idea that Jews are behind on the numbers, right? We have the Messiah, you are the 1.0 version, we are the 2.0 version, you gotta update, you gotta install the update um, because you guys are out of date. That's what supersessionism is at its core. It's the idea that, that Jews are no longer um, uh, their own thing and that they need to convert. They need to go and upgrade uh, to the newest uh, covenant. So that's supersessionism. Um, that builds up over time. And of course, as you're building that up over centuries, and this idea that, well, Jews should have been upgraded. Uh, why haven't they? It's been three, 400 years now. Um, after the Council of Nicaea, where you start going and having a um, uh, an actual set of church canon um, that people agree on at least for a while. Um, we're not going to include monocytes for not right now. Um, you start to see the concept of Jews as sinister develop in uh, the Middle Ages. So after the fall of Rome, uh, supersessionism is still a thing, but the early church uh, <clears throat> starts to develop parts of its um, canon that say that Jews are specifically responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. That is no longer canon today. I want to stress that. But back then it was. There's reasons for it. Like they, they just took over the Roman Empire, right? Christianity flipped the tables and is now the state religion of its of what originally was oppressing their people. That's huge. Now the problem is that if you go back to the story of the crucifixion, who are you going to blame the Romans or the Jews? Well, we're the Romans now. Why would we blame ourselves? So Jews end up becoming that doodle largely political decision by, by numerous people within uh, high-ranking parts of the church. So we start to see more portrayals of Jews as sinister, kind of building off that Judas type of um, uh, uh, setup where uh, they're crafty, they're behind the scenes, that they're, they're gonna sell everybody out, that type of Jews as sinister. And that's when we start getting things like the blood libel, which is the accusation that Jews are kidnapping children to use their blood to make matzah, which <laughs> wacky. One and two, have you ever had one? <laughs> Gosh, no, uh, it's so flavorless. I think you tell if there was blood in there. Um, and then we also see blame for the plague come up as, as plagues hit, and the plague wasn't just in 1300, there was another one in uh, 600 around the time of Emperor Justinian. Um, you can tell that I was a late Roman Byzantium major. Um, but we start to see blames for the plague. And part of this is because we forget here in the United States that Jews were heavily segregated from the rest of Europe. They were not allowed to go and uh, own land. They were not allowed to farm. They were not allowed to be a baker. They were not allowed to be a candlestick maker. They weren't allowed to do anything. And they, if they were um, in a city, they were relegated to a ghetto. Ghettos come from Italy. That's an Italian word. Nowadays, we use it to go and describe urban cores in the United States um, that are underfunded. Um, but it was it first described that exact same situation, but for Jews in Europe for hundreds of years. Um, 
and Jews were segregated out. They weren't allowed to work in a lot of industries, except we start to see a couple of things start to open up because with the enclosures, the nobles are starting to have a lot more money than they know what to do, right? And you're starting to get early modern banking. You're starting to get the first things of like fractional reserve lending and all this stuff where you can actually start making money on top of the idea of money on top of the idea of money on top of the idea of money. Um, you couldn't really do that if you had a largely illiterate population that didn't know how to do complex math, which is most of this time period. Now, when you start getting into the 1400s in places like Venice, they're starting to get into these early forms of banking. And this is where we start to get the image of Jews as in control of the bank starting to appear. Because Jews, for the most part, compared to the rest of your Europeans at this time, were more literate. A big part is that we read the Torah as part of our upbringing. So there were far more, and I would say not everybody was actually really literate in reading Torah. It still was actually very difficult to do that because most of the time your Torahs were being burned constantly. So you didn't really have enough Torahs to teach everybody. But Jews were slightly more literate than the rest of the population. So they began to be hired for these middlemen bureaucratic jobs. It was the only job that was allowed to work in. So this association with Jews as these managers telling you no, as an everyday person, you come into a bank and you need a loan, and the Jew tells you no. Well, gosh, you're going to say the Jews are in control of that because if you've never met another Jewish person ever, you've only heard all these stories from the church at the time. It's really easy to believe those things. So those things start to build up. This idea of financial control builds up in that period. But we also have those enclosures happening and the Reconquista in Spain where the Jews and uh, Muslims were expulsed in 1492. Columbus ju didn't just discover the new world, which he didn't really discover anything. Um, but in that same period, that same year, 1492, Spain reclaims, I, I put in quotation, reclaims its territory. The kingdom of Spain expulses all the Muslims and Jews, forces them all to convert. And then about like two, three years after forcing them all to convert, the site doesn't count. Um, in fact, if you have one drop of Jewish or of Moorish blood, you will never come to Spaniard or, or a Portu uh, Portuguese person. Um, and that's actually where we start getting those first racialization laws. They come from the Spanish Reconquista. They are then brought over to the new world. They are brought over uh, to go and help enforce those aspects of what becomes whiteness in the Americas. So that idea of if you have just one drop of blood in your ancestry, you cannot be part of this nation comes from that same time period. Of course, it changes over time, it grows. And lastly, the concept of nationalism begins to develop. And the concept of nationalism holds that there's, there's things that everybody shares equally. And this period of nationalism largely is linguistic nationalism. The idea that you share a mother tongue, you are the same people. Um, the idea was Jews didn't count. It was you are Jewish, not German. If if you speak Hebrew or do any of those things, you, you do not count as a German, you count as a Jew. You are not French, you are Jewish. You can't be Jewish and French, you are just simply Jewish. And that's how uh, 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 Jews kind of sat in Europe. So around 1789, there's this whole French Revolution thing, some liberal ideas are brought to Europe. Napoleon kind of kind of brings them everywhere else and he does stuff. Um, and Jews start to see this era of liberalization where they're now allowed to work in more industries. They're allowed to go to university. They're allowed to do more than just be in those two or three jobs. And during that period of the 1800s with that liberalization, welcoming of Jews into spaces they were never welcomed to before, we see anti-Semitism really grow into its own of what it is today, which, uh, next slide. Because this is where we see the race science part coming. And you may wonder, what the heck is a Semitism? Well, it's made up. And this is the racist we've been well apart. He was a German nationalist. Again, not a good son. Um, being a German nationalist in the 1870s, I don't particularly trust their opinions. So he comes up with this idea called anti-Semitism. And basically, he wanted to give this uh, this long-standing concept called Judenhass, which literally meant Jew hate. He wanted to give a new veneer, a new slap paint. Uh, because he was like, that's so yesterday. That's an idea that is, you know, full of mysticism of the church. Because this is this is that period of uh, industry and science where they want to we're the logical men of reason. We're not we're not bound by by superstition. So he wanted to go and update this Jew hate to the modern era, and he proposed uh, Semitism, 
And he took the word from the world of linguistics, which is why you can sometimes hear confusing things of, oh, Arabs and Jews are, are all Semites. Does being anti-Semitic mean that you're against Arabs and Jews? No, they're Semitic languages. They share many interesting things when it comes to uh, the ways that vowels work, the ways in which grammar works. That's why they are the same language family. But when we're talking about anti-Semitism, we're talking about a concept of race science. And in that concept of race science, the Semitism means Jewish. It always has meant Jewish. It is always meant to mean Jewish. And what he did was he imagined a worldwide Semitic conspiracy where Jews are inherently inclined, biologically inclined to undo European, by that he means Christian, uh, society. Um, that Jews inherently, biologically, culturally bound to their core are going to, anytime they enter a society, worm their way through it like termites and then undo it from the inside. And so for him, the logical and scientific sounding anti-Semitism was meant to be the antidote. He presents it as, well, if you want to be a good scholarly European, if you want to be adapted to the modern world, it would be simply the logical thing to be against the Semites. Because at the same time, there's tons of Jews who are now in the academy, and he does not like that. There are lots of new people in his social spaces that he wasn't used to, and this was the solution. It's very similar to today in the United States, the way that people respond to um, people of color who are appearing in jobs that you haven't, that people haven't seen them in before, and the assumption that, ah, this is affirmative action, you don't belong here, you were just handed this seat. Um, those types of assumptions, very similar to what was going on in Europe at the time. The assumption that you Jews just worm your way in here, you don't belong here. It's a very similar thing that we see with racialization in the US, where people who long were not in industries are now in them, and people get scared and say, you don't belong here. So, next slide. So Western political economic anti-Semitism, it's largely formed during nationalism, like I talked about, and due to time, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But this is, they go from being accused of heresy. Jews are no longer being accused of heresy. That's a, that's a different time, right? We're modern, we're, we're logical. And now you're going to be betraying your home state because of your dual loyalty. Because Jews, they know, they know Jews in other places. Because in Europe, yeah, you're going to have a cousin who's in a shuttle across the borderline that changes all the time. because. Nobles are arguing about who owns what land, and they're always at war with each other. So the assumption is that, well, Jews must be up to something. They all speak this language that uh, the larger Christian population doesn't understand, and the assumption is they must be sharing secrets. They must be up to something. We cannot trust them. And that's where the concept of dual loyalty comes, where a Jew cannot be loyal to their country. They always have to be loyal to someone else. In that time period, it was they're loyal to, quote, international Jewry today, Israel's kind of used as a fill-in, but largely when you hear people say this, what they really mean is the international banking Jews. They don't actually mean Israel, the country. Um, so the cycle of anti-Semitism, when anti-Jewish oppression isn't at its most brutal, it can be really hard to see, which is why it's really hard to see in the past few uh, years. And now it's starting to be a little easier for people to see, but still can be hard. So why does this oppression seem so invisible? Um, Partly because it allows Jews success, unlike other oppressions that we're used to identifying in the United States, it has this appearance that it's punching up. A lot of times it presents things as, well, I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm just calling out power, right? Like, come on, we're all like the little guy. We've got to fight against the man. And look, these guys have a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm just fighting for the little guy. That's what anti-Semitism presents itself. With a lot of other forms of oppression that we see, it can really quickly look like bullying, right? When, when all other forms of oppression that we see are people who are clearly in a minority, clearly uh, deprived of resources, live in poverty, it kind of feels a little like bullying. It looks a lot quicker like it's bullying, like it's picking on people. But with anti-Semitism, it says, no, 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 I'm not just all Jews, I'm just against the rich Jews. And, or it, it's always this portrayal of, I'm fighting against the man, I'm the guy fighting for the little guy. It creates this veneer that it's fighting against these big bad systems, but instead saying there's just one shortcut, there's just one little group of people we gotta get rid of. Um, so it ends up moving in cycles because of this. Um, and I say it moves in cycles since the 1800s, since this period of modernity that I've been describing this whole time. Because attacks come in waves, but each time things calm down and Jews are able to blend in or succeed in society again, it gives the appearance that anti-Semitism is over. Um, in some of the most famous examples of anti-Jewish expulsion and mass murder, medieval Spain, or modern Germany with the Holocaust, just prior to the attacks, Jews appeared to be one of society's most comfortable, successful, and well-integrated minorities. 
It is the uh, dangerous logical end of what people uh, today call model minority myth. So we see the model minority myth applied to much more than Jews today. In the United States, we've always presented ourselves as the melting pot. We're not quite a melting pot. We're more like a stew where if you've got complexion like ours in this room, you get to melt in a little easier. Everybody else doesn't necessarily get to melt in. But there's the thing about Jews. We're white until proven otherwise in the United States. And first off, I do need to state, 40% of American Jews are people of color. And among my age and younger, it's like 37% of American Jews are people of color. Most people assume Jews are all white. Uh, that is not true. Um, and that's a very important thing to uh, stress. But for white Jews like myself, we're just normal white people until proven otherwise, until we do something a little too Jewish, until we wear a kippah, until we do anything that is identifiably Jewish, we're just, we're just one of the guys. And that also makes it hard to go and identify. But for other uh, minority uh, groups like Asian Americans, uh, so South Asians and East Asian uh, 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 groups that, that are given kind of these portrayals of, well, this community is so good at math and science or whatever, that still goes and creates this hierarchy of race. It creates this order of operations that if you just act this way and do things this way, then you, you're great, welcome in. Uh, but as Jews have learned throughout modern Europe and uh, other places, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, you're gonna be okay in the end because ultimately you can still be cleaved off and viewed as, well, you've integrated a little too well, we wanted you in, but we don't want you in like that. And that is what we mean by moves and cycles, because the moment that things seem like they're doing successful, that is when the proof in the pudding happens. Well, Jews have to be racially controlled. Look, here's a couple people in Hollywood, but that is proof. That is the proof of it. Um, so how has it generally worked? Um, power structures isolate Jews, especially from other minority exploited oppressed groups in Europe. That is the form of the shadow or the ghetto, the being removed and segregated from the rest of society. In um, today, it's more of, in the United States experience, it's much more of that conditional whiteness that many American Jews experience, where they have, they maybe weren't allowed to work in uh, Henry Ford's factory, but they were technically allowed to go and uh, take out a bank loan and own a shop, right? Which then puts them into a role. Not everybody owns a shop. So if you don't own a shop, and the only shops on your street are owned by Jews, you assume, well, the Jews must be doing very successfully. Um, that's a similar type of thing where you don't necessarily know these people. Uh, and this is this is what much more of the Jewish experience in the United States is. It's the assumption of a little bit of success means permanent success. Um, power structures ultimately teach other people uh, out of identifying the sources of their exploitation. Um, and instead, oftentimes we see people uh, encouraged to channel their anger at Jews. Uh, if, if only uh, the Jewish landlords would lower your rent. It's not our really goofy system of uh, of property law in the United States that's causing this rent uh, uh, crisis, it must be uh, your local Jew landlord. That is the type of diversion that people uh, rhetorically get moved into. Um, Jews are targeted for violence or other danger. And <clears throat> then ultimately, uh, in the hopes of gaining safety, Jews end up cooperating with ruling elites, creating this, uh, pressure to silence ourselves and not rise up against the powerful protection against greater targeting. So what I mean by this is that ultimately, when you're targeted, it's really scary. I will say it is not great. And other communities experience being targeted all the time. And if you're not working in solidarity with other people who are being targeted for violence, ultimately you're still going to be coming into conflict with each other. And that's what we mean by this. In the American experience for many Jewish communities, it has been, it is safer to go and, you know, ask really nicely that the mayor does something about something um, than to go and be working with other communities experiencing uh, those pressure valves. Um, and a lot of times those are short-lived reforms. They don't fix everything. So the thing about anti-Semitism, the thing about oppressions, they're cultural. And that's a constantly moving target. When you're trying to make laws to deal with these things, it's like playing whack-a-mole with ideas. You can't do it. Ideas move too quickly. You can't legislate those the same way. You have to go and be addressing these bigger structural issues, not trying to get to, well, you can't say this word, you can't say that word, because somebody's going to come up with a new slur. I can tell you, I've seen so many new slurs just develop over the past decade online. Every week, sometimes there's new slurs. Um, there's always going to be a new way to go and say what you really mean. Um, and that's why this is not necessarily the system and why it ends up being that we get stuck in a cycle. Because if we're constantly 
going after the the ghost of what anti-Semitism was looking like last week, we don't know what it looks like tomorrow. So it's a historic and structural scapegoating. It's a synthesis. It's both of these things combined. It's all those big historical movements, but it's also many of these structural uh, parts uh, through law, through those other bits. Uh, it's more than just uh, individual acts of hatred. It certainly includes those. Um, it absolutely includes those. But it's ultimately a set of lies that story of, of developing white supremacy tells us that that uh, development of that cultural notion of a unified European background of whiteness uh, also, at its very core, carries over that European story of the Jews as not one of us. That's part of it. It's changed drastically from its origins in Christian persecution. It absolutely still has a lot of these bits in it. But it now has all these economic bits in there. It has these aspects of Jewish financial control over the entire globe. That doesn't come necessarily out of supersessionism, though certainly some people are animated into larger uh, anti-Semitic narratives, a Marvel Cinematic Universe worth of uh, uh, content, uh, maybe because they come in through a kind of supersessionist worldview, they ultimately accept this bigger uh, story. Um, and as the world has become simultaneously more interconnected and unequal, the power of anti-Semitic narratives has grown. So right now, here in the United States, our wealth gap is worse than it was in 1789 France before King Louis lost his head. Like, that's how much worse it is. Like, when, when you learn in your school books about, like, here's how much the king uh, had of the wealth, here's how much, like, the priestly caste had of the wealth, and here's how much the peasants had, it is actually worse at this point. When we, when we break it down by amount of population and how much of the pie there is. It's a different size of pie, absolutely, but that gap is bigger. People feel those things. They feel that something isn't right because most of us aren't getting a slice of that pie. And that's how anti-Semitic narratives get to grow because people are feeling that something isn't right. The anti-Semitic narratives provide a shorthand saying, ah, I'll tell you what's, what, what this is all about, where this came from. And that's cat. So this is a big way of dancing around uh, that whole process I described in that first slide. That's the development of capitalism. I'm not saying let's flip the tables and start the revolution. I'm just merely describing the economic world that we live in right now it is an economic world of largely private uh, assets, this private accumulation of wealth. And um, that system, all of those big companies uh, do have origins in these other things, either through the uh, property law in which we use, it's based off of doctrine of discovery, which was used to go and say indigenous people don't count as landowners, uh, or just the very basic thing that HSBC, that huge bank, <laughs> wait, no, it's HBSC. Anyways, it's the Hudson Bay Savings Company. Hudson Bay was like half of Canada. That was one colony owned by one trading group. There's a bunch of these companies still around. We don't even think about it. And that's what we mean by this capitalism, that big system that's grown over time. As it grew, it needed racism in order to dehumanize black and brown people to exploit for free and cheap labor. That period of colonization, what was that? That was a ton of exploitation to go and get those resources. Those big, beautiful buildings in Europe that we all love to look at, those were all built during that time period of colonization. Where did they get the wealth? Where did they get the ability to pay all those people to go and build it? They got it by taking it out of other places, uh, exchanging it for new things. Yes, it's the exchange of goods, but ultimately, where did those goods come from? So that process built up, and it still is happening now, like those cobalt mines that I mentioned. But anti-Semitism has grown at the same time as that story. But for the most part, anti-Semitism creates a scapegoat, a story, this veneer to obscure uh, the flaws of capitalism from itself. This isn't saying all of capitalism, there's tons of ways to reform things, but ultimately anti-Semitism works as that smokescreen from us identifying things that are wrong, that we could fix, that we could work democratically together and say, hey, this doesn't necessarily work. Anti-Semitism says, hit these guys instead. So, there you go. There you go. what it does, it Anti-Semitism, it helps keep those wheels of economic and social oppression hidden from you, obscuring class, caste, and racial oppression. It looks different in every country. For the most part, I've talked about the United States with our European flavors that we get just from being a country made up of largely uh, former Europeans. How it does it? It claims that Jews are this man behind the curtain controlling the levers of power. What it actually is, anti-Semitism is the curtain. It's the thing that obscures us from being able to look at and uh, uh, tackle these problems more deeply. Anti-Semitism kind of works as this smoke screen, this curtain blocking our view of seeing that, 
hey, there are structural problems in our society that we should address. There's lots of ways to address them. There's ways that we can address them politically. There's ways that we can address them interpersonally. But anti-Semitism is not the way to address them. So why do we need to understand all of this now? Anti-Semitism works in relationship with xenophobia and racism, diverting people away from systems oppressing them. And we're never going to be able to change those systems if we if we fall into those diversions. And our movements need to be able to learn how to identify those underlying power structures to dismantle those racialized parts of capitalism, those parts that don't give that equality, that don't create the structure of <clears throat> racism that continues, and massive power inequality. And it's never going to be by believing these Jews. And second, this political moment is loaded with conspiracy theories, and a lot of them have direct roots in anti-Semitism. So it's important to understand them in order to unpack and undermine them when we see and hear them. Because we only have a few minutes left, I do want to touch a teeny bit on white nationalism and use a couple examples of uh, that modern conspiracy theory stuff. So real quick, I want us to know the difference between white nationalism and white supremacy. A lot of times people use this interchangeably. They use it as a, uh, like a political buzzword to throw at each other. Um, and it gets confusing and it can get alienating. Um, white supremacy is the belief that white people with an asterisk next to it, because gosh, that definition has changed a lot over time. Some people who are considered white today were not considered white just 50, 60, 70 years ago. Um, and honestly, if you ask really ardent vocal white supremacists, they probably have 10 different opinions about who counts as white. So asterisk next to that. But it's this belief that white people or white culture, that idea of whiteness, that idea of that European uh, colonization system was good. Uh, that was a, it was a net good. That belief is white supremacy. That believes that oh, Europe colonizing the world brought them all trains and they should be thankful. That's white supremacy. Um, that doesn't mean that if you believe that you're wearing the plan, but that's just an example of the ways in which we take in these uh, concepts of European superiority kind of for granted, but without critically looking at oh, maybe this wasn't unnecessarily that positive. Um, now, white supremacy can also apply to systems that were founded on those beliefs or by people who held those beliefs. It can also apply to systems that continue to enforce uh, those artificial societal norms, like the ways that um, uh, decorum, uh, the way that we look at decorum, that, that can be an example of a lot of those come from the ways that European nobles thought was the most uh, wonderful example of politeness. That's not necessarily how every community views the ways to be polite and kind to each other. It's just the ways that European nobles did. No elbows on the table. Your fork and spoon have to be on specific parts of the plate. That type of thing is still an example of, of how white supremacy can be part of culture as well. Doesn't mean that you're a bad person if you do that. It just means that this is this is where these origin points come from. Um, white nationalism is that belief in white supremacy and saying, I like it so much, I want to make a country around it. I want to make a country around it exclusively for white people, whatever my goofy definition is. And what we need to know is that white nationalism is inherently a white supremacist ideology, kind of like how all squares are rhombuses, but not all rhombuses are squares. All white nationalists are white supremacists. Not all white supremacists are white nationalists. Um, this really helps us with understanding things like there are sometimes people who are people of color who evoke a lot of things from white supremacist rhetoric and people say, well, how could they be a white supremacist if they're black or they're Latino? Um, white supremacy can be that belief that that European culture is better, right? That, that West is the best, that, that we need to go and look at ancient Greece as, as the, the number one uh, civilization in history. Those types of notions can build into white supremacy. So this is how you can have somebody like Kanye saying a ton of really, really white supremacy stuff, even though he is not white in this society. Um, white supremacy is a little more fluid with who, who can espouse it, who can support it, who can think about it, versus white nationalism is that firm belief in I am part of that. I am firmly saying that I wish to be part of that identity and that nation state. That's the difference there. So white nationalist ideology summed up. Whites, with that asterisk again, are a biologically defined people. Largely, it's this European descended people. Sometimes they have their border, but who counts as white in Europe changes, uh, usually somewhere within the east of Europe. Um, black people and other people of color are biologically inferior underneath of this worldview. Therefore, their achievements present a logical and existential problem. This is where that Colin Kaepernick thing I mentioned in the beginning comes back in. Because 
in this white nationalist ideology, Jews are still considered a race, that demonic conspiratorial race that I mentioned with that concept of anti-Semitism. So whatever success people of color have in the Americas, Jews must be behind it. Jews must form a cabal that uses people of color as pawns to destroy white nationhood. So this is how we've seen a lot of anti-Semitism in the US grow in the decades since the civil rights movement. Because if you were an ardent segregationist and you really believed in that system, and then it was defeated in the courts, the courts, was it, was it black Americans organizing on their own? Or if you believed all black Americans to be biologically and intellectually inferior, it had to be somebody else. It had to be those Mennonite Jews. And that has been a, an actual catch-all in these movements for many years. And if we had more time, I'd go into the short history of white nationalism and where it comes from in the US. I highly recommend this book, uh, Culture of Warlords by Tal Lavin. Um, there's one more slide. So okay. yeah, just keep clicking through and I'll tell you when to stop. Okay. Um, ooh, go back to this one. Okay. Um, this with the I, I do want us to know in Minnesota, Minnesota was home to some of the biggest uh, fascist collaborator and, and, and Nazi lovers in, in the US. Uh, in the 1930s. Henry Ford, I know he wasn't in, in, the, in Minnesota, but he reprinted the czarist uh, forgeries, the Elder Protocols of Zion, which are basically the template for most anti-Semitic conspiracy theories we hear today. Uh, they are supposed to be the secretive meeting minutes of a group of rabbis saying, we're this close to world domination, we just need to do X, Y, and Z. The czar's secret police, when the czar was literally bankrupt in addition to being morally bankrupt, uh, issued that in 1903 in order to go and stir up pogroms, attacks against Jewish communities, uh, to go and hopefully distract that public resentment against the czar uh, towards other communities. Henry Ford translated that into English, distributed it at all of his um, uh, car dealerships in the 20s and 30s. Also, uh, he owned the newspaper in his factory town in Dearborn, Michigan, and printed these excerpts. The Nazis got the Elder Protocols of Zion from Henry Ford's English translations, not from that shared border with Russia. A lot of people think it's that shared border, that proximity that let that document move. It was actually the translation to English and the many German uh, boon people here in the United States, that was the, the, the Nazi support group here, uh, that really adored his writings and sent them back to the right. Uh, the Silver Legion, the Silver Shirts, they're a bunch of dweebs. Um, I would talk about them later, but uh, Charles Lindbergh, another thing, much beloved by, by the Nazi state, much like Henry Ford was. And Father Coughlin was basically like the early version of a Rush Limbaugh, but honestly more like an Alex Jones. Uh, he had 20 million plus listeners in the 1930s, and he really pushed this idea that Jews are responsible for both capitalism and communism at the same time. The Great Depression? That was the Jewish bankers trying to do a communist plot. It didn't make any sense, but that was his thing. Um, so one more slide, and I want to conclude with the great replacement theory. This is a white nationalist conspiracy theory that Jews are trying to replace white people with black and brown people. Um, and next slide. Um, the great replacement theory is a unifying element for a lot of these uh, white nationalist groups we see all across, not just the United States, but the world today. Um, a lot of them are sharing this. You can go to white nationalists in Norway, you can go to white nationalists in Ukraine, in Latvia, uh, in New Zealand. Uh, they all have this shared idea that that shared vision of European whiteness is being erased by meddling Jews, bringing in people from the rest of the world in refugee laws, things like that. Um, this isn't a new thing. This is something that has dominated much of uh, European thought for the last couple hundred years. Um, the anti-immigrant laws of the 1920s United States basically cited uh, versions of this, but today it comes from a very specifically neo-Nazi space. It comes from this uh, uh, thing called the 14 words. It's basically like we can't replace, uh, you know, our white race with other people's babies type of thing. Uh, it's a very common thing that we hear on TV today, and I want people to know that central to it is that antagonizing that social malaise, saying, yes, things aren't working out well for you, but guess what? It's because there it, it pulls on that long catalog, that that history, that deep familiar catalog of racist ideas in American and white European culture. It says the reason why things aren't good is because of these meddling Jews and these other populations trying to outpopulate you. And it's a very very popular um, uh, conceptualization today. So with that. Um, Thank you so much for letting me go one minute over time. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions folks may have.
Um, uh, I, I have like a fire hose of knowledge in my brain. <laughs> if I would share. It's a lot. When, when I say it's a one on one, I really mean it's like one of those one on ones that you do the entire weekend where it's like your eight hour intensive weekend course. Um, Tell them about your online. How they yeah. Do. So online, I do a 90 minute version of this um, and uh, at Jewish Community Action, it's it's free of charge. We, we have them about every month or two. Our next one's on May 4th, uh, where we have um, uh, this presentation, but it has a third module on there. I have a little more time to talk about that history of slides that we zipped through, um, connecting how Confederate lost causeism, this idea that the Confederacy were actually uh, chivalric good guys, um, is connected to those uh, concepts of, of white nationalism in the US. But I also talk about the internet, and that's something that's really important for me, because when I was uh, one of my best friends growing up, uh, was actually radicalized into a uh, white nationalist uh, Texas secessionist militia about 10 years ago. He passed away 10 years ago. I don't have to worry about you know him having committed any atrocities since then. But for 10 years, I was going to figure out what the heck happened. And um, that's something, this is something I've been very passionate about learning about for the last uh, 10 years. I was very lucky to find a job doing so three years ago. Um, and uh, that's why I highly recommend uh, Culture Warlords because it does keep catch you up on uh, how online radicalization works. That's what happened in my room. It was before YouTube and algorithms, but it still holds up. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, like, where you grew up, where you went to school, that sort of thing. Absolutely. Uh, I grew up in Dallas, Texas. Um, I grew up in specific, uh, the place that I went to school was actually uh, the neighborhood that George W. Bush moved back to after his presidency. Uh, Margaret Thacker's granddaughter was our star track athlete. Uh, it was a very, very, very uh, wealthy white public school due to the way that they had segregated themselves out during the year of busing. They created a fictional second school district to bus from themselves. Um, that's where I grew up. Um, and uh, then I went to uh, university at uh, Tulane University in uh, New Orleans. Uh, did a little bit of law school, hated it, dropped out in Richmond, Virginia. And then I got a master's public policy here in Minnesota uh, at the Humphrey School uh, a couple years ago in elections. Did I answer all the questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I can keep talking. <laughs> um, I, I do I recommend for people who uh, are, are really wanting to learn more about like concepts like Christian nationalism that we hear a lot about. Um, uh, check out Faithful America. Um, they have their own Twitter, but their website's really great. Uh, they have a lot of great materials uh, for understanding what people mean by that and uh, how it is it is the veneer of Christianity, it's not actual Christianity. But a lot of times when people say, ah. Christian nationalism, it could feel very like, like very much like it's a poison attack against people um, who, who are people of faith who, who don't engage in that. Um, I know I certainly as a young man growing up in Texas during the Bush era of uh, being a Jewish kid getting bullied by by very, very ardent uh, Southern Baptists who were not particularly kind. I have this uh, idea as a young man that all religions, especially all of Christianity, was, was cruel like that. I know that is not true, and that's a really tough part about the ways in which uh, a lot of our politicized world is right now, where it's this, this presented as dichotomies of always constant good and evils. And I highly recommend Faithful America because I think they're a really great resource for uh, people within Christian faith communities to identify those, those, those bad actors who want to go and, and use a, uh, a faith system to, to harm others, which, as we all know, that's not the purpose of Christianity. That's not the purpose of Judaism. That's not the purpose of Islam. Uh, quite a lot of times within each of our faith systems, there are people who like to go and, and utilize those for, for other purposes. Well, thank you, Brandon. Yeah, I think we, uh, we could definitely have you back again this fall. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just so much to take in. And yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you're all, uh, and I'm happy to go and uh, send an email to you afterwards, uh, uh, resources, interesting books, short articles. I've got, I've got things of all sizes, everything from, you know, the, the short uh, web 